Welcome into the Paul Farrington Show. Paul Farrington joined alongside Robert Ziggy Ziegler at the University of Virginia. Hopefully on Wednesday night's record for Thursday's show, we have Jack and Zach back with us for that episode. But today, a, uh, a classic Paul and Ziggy episode. Ziggy, we're going back to our Notre Dame days here. Yeah, it's, uh, I feel like I'm on the old WVFI radio station. Just you and me talking sports. People aren't showing up. I mean, it's a pretty <laughs> typical you and me experience. The Will Coots, uh, our old friend Will Coots on the first ever episode we had, sleeping through the show. Um, and Ziggy and I would just find ways to figure out something to talk about. So, But today, we, we have a really fun episode today. Uh, as the draft draws closer and closer now, what, we're nine days away from uh, one of our favorite sports days of the year, the NFL draft. We, uh, we're really going to dive into the quarterbacks today and predict where we think they'll go, whether we think they'll play right away, and what their immediate impact for their team will be. Because there's six quarterbacks right now who are being discussed as potential first-round candidates. Some are locks, some are a little bit more on, on the edge of that. So we're, we're going to go through and share our predictions for where we think those guys are going to go within round one, if at all. And then at the end of the episode, we were asked a little bit about Jordan Love has been mentioned as potentially getting a top 10 contract in the NFL for quarterbacks. And the Packers are also opening their season in a very interesting location next year. We're going to talk a little bit about those uh, two topics that we got some questions about over the weekend. And uh, and then, and then yeah, then we'll be back on Thursday. As It's crazy. Then we'll be a week away. And there's still so much up in the air, Ziggy, with draft conversations. It's It feels like over the past week, that's really kind of been quieted down, though. Uh, so this is a little fun activity that we'll be able to go through here. Why don't we jump into it? We'll go the way we're going to do this. I'm just going to give you picks. I'm going to go through the order of the first round and I'm going to say, all right, Ziggy, who's going here? And we'll see if you have a quarterback and whether or not I agree with it. Does that, that sound good to you? That seems right. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's roll. So the first pick of the draft, the Bears. Got Every, be, everyone knows. Right? Yeah. It's Caleb Williams. Williams. All right. We don't really need to get into too much conversation of uh, whether or not we think this will happen. It seems like it is a lock at this point. Um, and you expect him to play right away, correct? I mean, who else are they going to play? <laughs> the Bears, Kale Williams has a very good chance of being the best quarterback the Bears have ever had in year, in year one. one. I mean, in the Bears one. have never had a 30 touchdown passer in their franchise history. So maybe the more appropriate question for Caleb then is what will the immediate impact be? Uh, and moving from Justin Fields to Caleb next year, all the new weapons they're going to have. They have another top 10 pick in the draft sitting there at the number 10 spot. So do you think that this Caleb Williams immediate impact, we've done a few video clips on uh, expectations for the Bears. Are you thinking this is a, a team that gets maybe seven wins, eight wins, or, or potentially flirts with a wild card spot and double digit wins next year? It's tough to tell because a lot of it comes down to what you think happened at USC, mm -hmm. right? Here is the Caleb Williams only has one real concern as a prospect. And that is that when he's, he, when he's off schedule, he's looked great but he consistently got off schedule at USC. Now you can explain that away, right? The offensive line was horrendous. Last year, he didn't have serious receivers. Lincoln Riley, for as much hype as he gets, has not clearly been that guy. Mm -hmm. So the question is, was it just the circumstances and is Caleb Williams going to step in and show right away that he can play on schedule? Or is it going to take a little bit of time? I think those skills are going to come. But would it be surprising to see him struggle his the first half of the season, the NFL, and turn it around? Not really. So I think that Caleb Williams is going to take a little bit of time to adjust to the NFL, but not a lot. I think by the time weeks five or six roll around, the Bears are going to completely forget the name Justin Fields. And I think they'll be finishing the season right around that seven or eight win window. I know that a lot of people in the media were running with the Justin Fields versus Caleb Williams question for a lot of this offseason. You know, most people knew at the end of the day that yeah. this is what was going to happen. And it's what should happen because Justin Fields versus Caleb Williams really isn't much of a contest when you, when you come to actually throwing the football and the potential, the ceiling that Caleb Williams has as opposed to Fields, who I actually still think can be a solid quarterback in this league. But Caleb Williams are talking about a guy who could get into that top five potentially. Now, it's funny that, you know, you mentioned how he could get off script and when he's off script, he can be just unbelievable at times. And I, I think what you could see from him, as you said, that first half of the year struggles potentially, you know, just take a look at their biggest rival, the Packers and Jordan Love, you know, getting more comfortable as the year went on. Now, Caleb might not play the way Jordan did over the final 10 games or so, where that was just, um, we're talking MVP level football. 
But I think you might see something similar where at the beginning of the year, yeah, it takes a little while to get acclimated um, under pressure. You know, we'll have to see how that Bears offensive line performs. But there's certainly the weapons there that once Caleb Williams becomes comfortable and checks in mentally, because all the physical tools are there. But once he checks in mentally, I really think that you're looking at Chicago Bears team that that, that is going to flirt with a wild card spot. I, I definitely think they're good enough. I mean, their schedule is incredibly easy for what they have to do. So there's certainly a chance they flirt with a wild card spot. The question is just how quickly can Caleb Williams set into the NFL? And it's a big adjustment. You know, I will say if you're, if you're excited about him, this is something a lot of people I think don't realize because there's been a lot of talk about how he's a little baby who paints his nails or whatever. Yeah, I don't agree with this that. guy is incredibly physical. He is incredibly athletic. You know, his middle school nickname was Bobby Boucher because he could run that. over anyone. <laughs> Like this is this is a guy who is he, I think he will come in day one. He's incredibly tough. I mean, you saw as much bad tape as there was in that Notre Dame game. He was getting hit play after play and still kept getting up to try and lead the team. This guy, I think, is not going to have to adjust on that level in the NFL. Well, that's one thing when you when you're watching Caleb Williams versus JJ McCarthy tape, one thing that jumps out immediately. I you know, it's funny. I was watching maybe a week or two ago. I I, I did both of them in one night. Um and JJ, you know, the time again, I, I like JJ McCarthy as a prospect, but when you look at the time to throw, I mean, Caleb Williams is getting, I mean, it's just people are bearing down on him basically every single play. It felt like at USC last year, you know, the weapons he had were not, you know, Jordan Addison wasn't there last season. Um, and every once in a while he makes a play still where you just go, wow. I mean, there's maybe one or two guys in all of college football that maybe even in the NFL, there's only a handful of people who can make some of the throws he makes. Um, but that, yeah, the Notre Dame game, I know is one, one thing that people, a lot of people are talking about eh, people have bad games. I mean, he was under the, Notre and, Dame I mean, was great. it wasn't that bad of a game from him. I get that the numbers mm, were terrible. Pretty bad. No, but if you look at a lot of things went wrong around him that weren't his fault and he still put together quite a few good plays. I mean, it's the thing with Caleb Williams, right? If you were to make a list of wow plays, Caleb Williams would lead FBS probably by a mile in terms of how many wow plays he generates. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, he's, he's sensational. Okay, maybe we could go back to this for just a second here. Off the top of your head, Ziggy, where do you think you would rank Caleb Williams in terms of F quarterbacks you would currently want in the NFL next year? How many guys are you for sure taking ahead of him? Let me think for a second. So you got Burrow, Herbert, Jackson, Mahomes, Allen, Prescott, Probably Kyler, probably Watson. Oh, I don't know, Watson? actually, Real? Stafford. You take Watson? So we're just talking next season. Yeah, let's just say just for next season, who would you want? Your team? Yeah, the thing, so the thing is, again, I think it's going to be, it's always a tough transition to the NFL, especially at the quarterback position. You know, of course, I can't forget Jordan Love. I can't forget Trevor Lawrence. I can't forget C.J. Stroud. I'd probably put him right around there, around 13, 14, 15. I think he's going to be close to an average quarterback, mm -hmm. which out of a rookie is as much as you can ask for. I think people forget how horrendous, even for good NFL quarterbacks, an average season is very, very good as a rookie. If you're able to meet that mark, there's a good chance you'll become that guy. Jared Goff is above him, but right around that 14, 15, 16. Range. Would you have Kirk and Purdy above him? Kirk is just such a wild card to me. I can't say. Mm -hmm. Pretty, yeah, sure. Pretty, yeah, sure. So in the NFC, then at least you're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, so seventh quarter. I mean, here's the thing is I yeah. think in the first half of the season, Jordan Love is going to be well below average. But really? by the time you get that second half, or not Jordan. Oh, Caleb. Caleb Williams. Okay. I don't know why I said Jordan I, Love. I, 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 I it's, it's, it's on the brain. Wishful thing. But, uh, yeah, and I, I hope Jordan Love is below average. But I think for the first half of the season, Caleb Williams is going to be well below average. But then when you hit that second half of the season, I think he's going to be one of the better quarterbacks in the NFC. And going into year two, I expect big things. Yeah. But again, so much of it is just, and you can't know this, what happened at USC? And we are going to find out Chicago yep. next yep. year. All so, right, so do you have a closing thought there? I was just going to say, I think it's time to move on. I know we said we weren't going to talk a lot about him, but he's, no, just, no, but he's he, such an interesting yeah. prospect. I mean, I don't know why there's so many people who want to be down on Caleb Williams, I think, because they're just trying to get clicks or views or whatever. There's a reason this guy's been the number one prospect for two years in a row. 
it's just happening. I I found it borderline unbelievable just how this quarterback class for all you know they're still hyped up as a very good quarterback class, and especially it seems within NFL circles as being one. But a lot a lot of fans it seems are down on the quarterbacks from where they were a year ago. You know, last year if you told a uh, Commanders fan. Hey, you're going to get Drake May. They'd immediately sign that piece of paper. And now it's like, yeah, do we want Drake May? I, I mean, I, yeah, they want Drake May. Drake May is the pick at number two. <laughs> so let's go to the commanders. All right. So do you think they're going to take Drake May? Like, e- even if you think it's the pick, do you think they will do that? I don't understand why everybody is hyping up Jaden Daniels. I think the player is very, very good, right? He's one of the everything good, Paul. Oh, I'm just making sure. I, for a second, I th- couldn't remember if I recorded or not. <laughs> no, no, you, we're recording. We're good. There's a lot of hype around Jaden Daniels, and I get it. He's an exciting player, but Drake May has been the number two guy for two years now. I get that 2023 was a regression, but everybody's acting like this guy's a prospect, and I just don't quite see it. Now, I admit there's some work to do, like there is of everybody, right? But like you look at this guy, you want size out of an NFL quarterback. Even now, some of the smaller guys in that Russell Wilson mode, like taking, getting some hype. You want size. He's got size. You want an arm. He's got arm. You want mechanics in the pocket. He's got mechanics in the pocket. You want a guy who sees the whole field, but knows how to manipulate defenders with his eye. Like he's reckless, right? This, you saw this on tape, but those kinds of things can be coached away. This is a guy of above average accuracy, a killer arm. And a lot of the things that you look for that translate into the pros He's not leaving some elite program, right? Everything got around worse around him at UNC and he suffered a little bit, but it's not like he's got Lincoln Riley. It's not like he's got all those guys at Michigan and he consistently produced in an ACC that even though it had some ups and downs was pretty difficult. So I am absolutely all in on this prospect. He's been my number one. You can go back and see it. He's been my number one for two years now. Yeah, I mean, I I get why people like Williams more. I don't think there's a bad choice between them, but I love Drake May, and I think the Commanders will too. Look with all the rumors, <laughs> with all the rumors about the Vikings getting Drake May right now, uh, I'd be so oh, thrilled. Oh, dude, Paul. I, the reaction that we would have on this show would be through the through the roof. I I'd be so happy <laughs> if you told me right now you get Drake May. I saw a mock draft the other day where the Vikings get Drake May at nine. <laughs> they trade up to nine to get Drake May. And I was just going like, what the hell are people talking about right now? This is ridiculous. Um, I agree with you that Drake May should be the picket to his ceiling, the build, everything you just said about him. It, I, I, I believe it. I think he's going to be a very good quarterback. Um, but I actually think they're going to wind up going the commanders with Jaden Daniels. I think it's a mistake, but I do understand the allure of Jaden Daniels. Uh, you know, the, the dual threat ability. A lot of people think he's the best dual threat quarterback to come out. Um, in years, and that includes you know the freak show Anthony Richardson yeah. dual threat Anthony ability. Knows. Yeah, sure. Hey, you know who had fifty six rushes of ten plus yards over the past two seasons? Drake May. Now that's behind Jaden Daniels, but that is only behind Jaden Daniels across all of the FBS. Well, Ziggy, to be this fair, that, I mean that, that's exactly why the Commanders, you know, that that that's the allure Jaden Daniels is that he is the best at <laughs> the dual threat ability. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, here's. We'll get to Jaden Daniels in a second, but here's the thing is Jaden Daniels had a ton of terrible years and one really, really good year. And everyone wants you to tell to tell you the one really, really good year is the only year that matters. This isn't a Joe Burrow situation where he never got a chance. And once he got a chance, he lit up the world and he consistently improved. This is a guy who had two really tough seasons at Arizona State in the first year at LSU. Drake May, I get this year was a little bit less good. But he had an inc- he was incredible every moment that he played. Oh, Besides no, a couple I, I bad agree games. with you. I think, He's been I think bad Drake May should out. be the pick. I think Drake May should be picked. So I'm guessing then at three, the Patriots, I have them taking Drake May, given my mock of Caleb, Jade, and Drake May. Do, who do you have them taking? I think they're going to take Jaden Daniels. Okay, like, so we, not got, we got the same folks. top three, yeah. just a little different order. No. People are overthinking this. They're getting excited about J.J. McCarthy, and I get why people are excited about J.J. McCarthy. Daniels has a lot to like. Now, there are some concerns about him as a prospect. You, you just rip him apart, and then, and then your next thing, Jaden Daniels has a lot of things you like. No, I mean, look, I'm not trying to rip the guy apart, right? Like, there are concerns, and when I'm talking about those concerns, that's why he's not my number one, number two guy. Mm-hmm. But again, there's a lot to be excited about, right? This is a guy who, as you said, he's excellent at running. His placement on deep ball throws was really excellent. Deep ball is great. He did, 
he did an incredible job over two years in the SEC of winning interceptions. He threw seven interceptions across two seasons in the SEC. Mm -hmm. Like that's pretty good when you look at what was it like 55 touchdowns, like 6,000 yards, 17 intercept or seven interceptions. Yeah. I mean, Heinz winner. Play. Yeah. So like it's, I worry a lot about the size. I worry about the talent around him. I worry about how old he is. I worry about the fact that you combine that size of a guy who likes to take a whole lot of hits. I worry about the fact that he leaves the pocket a little bit too early, but this is a guy who works incredibly hard. Who's a dangerous runner who, even though he doesn't have the strongest arm, has a very good arm and in particular, a very good arm on the run. I love his throwing mechanics. Like, I don't know how many times you've seen him throw, but his release would immediately enter and be one of the better ones in the NFL. Like he's an electric athlete and we've seen, you know, everybody wants to say that being an electric athlete, you enter the NFL, everyone's a good athlete. This guy's a great athlete. He's not quite Lamar Jackson, but he's closer than anyone other than Justin Fields. But unlike Justin Fields, he can also throw the football. Well, and I, I mean, a lot of people took notice of it throughout the year where what I was he even a first round quarterback at the start of the year, maybe a late first round. No, I mean, number? no, he wasn't on people's radars because he was coming yeah. off a bad seasons at Arizona State and a mediocre season at LSU. Yeah. So uh, people knew of the potential, but then to see it explode the way it did now, how much of that you know, it is a product of having two of the better receivers in college football, too. I mean, the LSU offense was was pretty good last season, but uh, you can't deny the talent that Jaden Daniels has. A big question that people are going to ask is whether the Patriots are even going to draft a quarterback. And a lot of people are questioning whether Gerard Mayo and company would rather trade back to a team like the Vikings or perhaps the Broncos, whoever it may be, load up on draft picks and try and build out this team. Uh, a little bit more before going in on a quarterback. But I know your opinion on this is, and then I think it's the correct opinion, is you, you can't really do anything until you have the quarterback anyway. So may as well keep throwing darts. And when you're picking top three in the draft, in a QB heavy draft, uh, I think New England will ultimately wind up going quarterback. Yeah, I mean, here's what people want teams to do, right? What they want them to do is build a great roster and be where the Vikings are. Right, where you have to give up two or three first round picks in order to move up and take a quarterback. I don't know why people think that's any less risky than taking a quarterback at the top, putting them I, in I a agree. little bit of a worse situation, but building around them afterwards. If you can't handle a bad year in the NFL, if getting hit is going to absolutely ruin your career, it is unlikely that you are going to make it in the first place. There's no other position in the NFL where people say that the system around them just determines their career success. I want to take Jaden Daniels when I have a chance to take a quarterback who's an elite talent. And he is that. Will he grow into it? Who knows? Am I worried that he's going to get lit up and be out of the NFL soon of injuries? It's possible. But I love this guy. Well, that's, that's the whole thing, too, like you said with the Vikings, is they have a, an excellent roster around the around whoever whatever quarterback will come in but at the same time if if you miss on that guy you know if you, if you don't nail the quarterback eventually you get to the point where you have an aging roster an expensive roster and and you have no quarterback to show for it so i i, I yeah I, I agree with you where sure it's nice to have the pieces around but you still have to nail the pick so when you have the opportunity to make that pick go for it if, if they like that now if they hate all the prospects that's a different story yeah, but I think it's unlikely that they won't look at Agreed. either Jaden yeah. Daniels or J.J. McCarthy and say, there's a guy here who's worthy of the pick. You have to hate the yeah, 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 I mean, you have to really be down on, on whoever it is to, to go in a different direction when, I mean, I mean, are the quarterbacks next year really that? Is they're next year they're, they're widely <laughs> regarded as much worse. Yeah, yeah. And so. there's always some risers, but no, I'd much rather have Jaden Daniels right now than or Drake May. Yeah, or Drake May, yeah. Yeah, then a shot at any of those guys. Because here's the thing, right? Is that the Patriots have the worst record in the league, they'll get QB1. But if they don't, I mean, you're talking, it's it's realistic they'll be in QB2, QB3, even QB4 situation again, mm -hmm. but with a much worse class around them. So what, we, what we'll do for the rest of the quarterbacks here, I'm just going to go through the draft and you stop me, okay? Or I'll stop when I think that the trade will happen, okay? Sure. Or I'm, I'm assuming it'll be a trade, unless if you think it just plays out. So. Yeah. Uh, let's go for the Cardinals. Think you think that'll be Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah, no, there's don't listen to any of the there's another receiver out there. It's a bunch of crap. Oh, yeah, I completely. I, I look, I'd love to come out here and say, you know, 
And the athletic Randy Mueller ran a piece today saying Romo Dunze, number one, Malik Neighbors, number two, mm-hmm. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the ninth best prospect in this class. Yeah, the, don't listen to the clickbait. He's clearly the best wide receiver. Yeah, I don't want to. Hear I, that. I believe he will also go forward to the Cardinals. How about the five? How about the Chargers at five? I think the Chargers are trading back. I also think they're trading back. Who do you think that is making the move? So it's an interesting question. I think it's going to be a bidding war between the Vikings, the Raiders, and the Giants. No Broncos? I I think the Broncos don't want to move up. They might, but I think this Broncos ownership is just burned by the Russell Wilson experience. I think they don't want to move up. But I could be wrong. They certainly could be in play. All right, so who's but I think Do you say who's going? Who's winning this bidding war? I think it is going to be the Vikings trading up for J.J. McCarthy. I'm with you. I also agree. Three picks. Here's the thing is the Vikings have enough talent and they're in a win now situation where they're really incentivized to give up whatever they can to move on. On the other hand, I, the Raiders, you know, they've got new people in town. They're not under a lot of pressure. The Broncos, Sean Payton's got a leash and I don't think they're super desperate to move up, even though the situation's tough. The Vikings have the combination of roster that wants to win now with guys who are just the seat's not hot yet, but it's warming up. They want to move up and get their quarterback. So if the Vikings go up for McCarthy, we, we actually skipped over the the little will they play an immediate impact for Jane Daniels and May. We expect both of them. They, but yeah, they there's no question. Playing. They'll both play. The impact will be what you'd expect from a rookie quarterback. Yeah, I, th- I think that the bear situation for Caleb is much, much nicer than what the commanders or Patriots can provide. Daniels and May. So that that'll be yeah, that that'll just be, you know, standard rookie quarterback. Take your licks. Yep, exactly. Um, completely agree. With JJ McCarthy, assuming the Vikings wind up getting him, I I actually don't believe he'll play most of the season. I, mean, I think Sam Darnold's gonna be the guy. And unless Darnold is just terrible midway through the year, which I actually think he, he'll be okay. Um, I'd be surprised if we see JJ McCarthy early in the season at all. Maybe, maybe towards the end. I just I don't know who this guy is. I, that's no, the no, thing that's, about the JJ question. McCarthy. that's the question. Yeah. There's, and honestly, the Sam Darnold projections, we also, I have an idea of who he is, but clearly the NFL doesn't agree with me. They feel like we don't have an idea of who he is or else he wouldn't be getting a job. But the thing about JJ McCarthy that's just so strange is when he was asked to do things, he looked really good, but he was so rarely asked to do <laughs> things that it's just very hard to tell who this guy is. You know, on like money downs, they're called third or fourth down. Almost 50% of his passes resulted in a first down. Oh, he's great. That's really unusual, right? He had seven turnovers last year. He was excellent on the move when Michigan needed some big plays. People forget this in the playoffs. Yeah, that Bama drive, he stepped up and made the plays over and over again. Now, of course, Michigan had a mediocre pass blocking offensive line the best run blocking offensive line in football and Blake Corum. So of course they ran the ball a bunch, but there was some evidence that McCarthy could be exciting. And as an athlete, there's plenty there. On the other hand, we saw him throw so rarely. He didn't even have 800 career dropbacks in college, right? This is a guy who did not play much. This is a guy who, unlike say Drake may, really struggled in certain aspects of reading the field. You could just look at his eyes as a cornerback and know exactly where the ball was going. His accuracy was tough, especially on the deep ball, especially to that left side of the field. We've talked about it before. I'll say it again. He's not big. You know, everybody's talking about Jaden Daniels' frame, and there's something to worry about there. But J.J. McCarthy's only an inch higher and 10 pounds heavier. It's not like this guy's huge. You know, Ziggy, So there are a lot of concerns here. I think he might be... The most bizarre top five potential quarterback we've had in in a long, long time. You know, just go back and think. He he doesn't have the ceiling of an Anthony Richardson, at least from you know the pre draft process here, the grades and everything. You don't look at at JJ McCarthy and go, oh, if this works out, I mean, he could be he could be an absolute stud. I, I don't feel that way about JJ McCarthy. And then you know, to think back to someone who rose up towards the end of the draft process. You know, Baker Mayfield. All of a sudden, vaulted up to one, but Baker won the Heisman. Like Baker, Baker was had crazy numbers at Oklahoma. JJ McCarthy doesn't really have the numbers, and he doesn't really have the ceiling either. Yet it's almost like his character and and will to win is driving him up draft boards right now. Where and I I know that when the more you look into it, the more NFL evaluators look at it. The the things they want to see are there. 
But from you know the fan perspective, it's just that he's a very perplexing top five candidate. And I don't think I'd be excited if the Vikings took McCarthy. If they, if they went and got Daniels or May, I would be excited. I'd I'd be more I'd be cautiously optimistic with JJ McCarthy. I'd be I'd be hope hoping that it works out. Uh, do you feel the same way as a Viking fan? I firmly disagree about JJ McCarthy's ceiling. If you look at the kinds of, I get that he's not, he doesn't have the ceiling that an elite athlete does in the NFL, but he's a plus athlete. The guy can play football. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And if you look at the kinds of things that, you know, it feels like everybody has forgotten how most quarterbacks in the NFL are successful. Here's how most quarterbacks in the NFL are successful they're accurate, they manage pressure really well, they're mentally calm, they don't make a lot of mistakes. And when it comes time for them to make a big play, a big play comes up. That is what J.J. McCarthy showed in college. Now, did he show it as much as some of these other guys? No, but he showed a guy who's good at passing, who's very athletic in the pocket, who stays cool under pressure, who seems at least most of the time to make the right read. You know, there were some issues of his eyes, but this is a guy who can manage pre-snap pressure well. And this is a guy who works incredibly hard to improve at the game. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I hate talking about culture stuff because it's so hard to tell from the outside. But everyone at Michigan says this is a guy who stepped in and said, I'm tired of losing. We're going to beat Ohio State. We're going to win a national championship. And when he came in, that sounded crazy, right? When he was coming in and first starting out, this was Harbaugh took a giant pay cut because nobody believed in him. It looked like Harbaugh was on the way out. The program was in shambles, right? They couldn't beat Ohio State to save their life. He never lost to Ohio State. He won a national oh, no, the championship. The turnaround was remarkable. The turn, the and it's hard not to point at this guy and say he and his culture and his intangibles were the reason. But again, if he were just intangibles, I'd think great backup. He's the kind of guy you want in your locker room. I really think that we saw him in a pro style offense. The Vikings will need to work with him. They'll need to develop him. They'll need to build an offensive system around him. But I think this guy has as high a ceiling as anyone in this draft. And something that might impact the way people the common fan perceives jj mccarthy too is think about the superstar quarterback right now Who, who's in that tier one quarterback group would, would you say it's probably mahomes josh allen lamar joe burrow at this moment in time i throw herbert in there too yeah maybe you throw herbert in there most of those guys there are you know superhuman arms you know i'm josh allen six foot five lamar has the athletic ability JJ McCarthy, Joe Burrow's the, the one dude there who I think if you had to compare McCarthy to one of them, it would have to be Joe Burrow. Where, but most of those superstar quarterbacks have attributes to them where it just seems like they're almost superhuman. JJ McCarthy, I don't think has that, but you know, Joe Burrow's superhuman attribute is probably just that he's a winner and, and a cold blooded killer. I mean, look, if he, if JJ McCarthy is Brock Purdy, if JJ McCarthy is Kirk Cousins on a rookie contract, that's a huge win. I mean, yeah, well, I think Kirk is, I think Kirk is really, really. Yeah, but there's me, there are a lot of, again, the superhuman athletes, they have the highlight reels and they get a lot of attention, but you can be a top 10 quarterback. You can have top five seasons. If what you are is a calm, controlled plus passer with enough athleticism to scramble and mm -hmm. manage pressure. No, I agree. And I JJ agree. McCarthy's that guy. All right. Look, I'm, I'm, a, look, look, I'll he might, you. he might <laughs> suck. Right. He could come in the NFL, be 200 pounds, right? Show that Michigan didn't go to him because it was no good. He did basically nothing athletic at the combine or at the pro day. He could come in and suck. It is absolutely possible. But at the end but of the I day, I believe in this guy. At the end of the day, you're throwing darts. At the end of the, the, end of the day, you're, you know, you're hope, hoping. You I, don't, I don't think he's a worse prospect than Jaden Daniels. I just think he's he's so different than, as you say, almost anyone ever. But in particular, he's so different than the top three quarterbacks in this draft that he just feels like an alien. And I have no idea what's going to happen to this guy. But we've been saying for months, right, the media is finally going to catch up with the NFL and realize there's a lot to like about this guy. I think there's a lot to like about this guy. So we're, we're pretty confident. Everyone's confident that those four quarterbacks will go all in the top 10, if not the top five. Now we'll just go through here and we'll, we'll just kind of touch on the teams that might be interested in a quarterback and whether or not we could see Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr. going to one of those teams. So the Giants are another team. Everyone's talking about going after a quarterback. I think in this situation, they'll go after Malik Neighbors. They're definitely, if they miss out on one of those four, 
maybe, maybe you could see him trade back or something, but I think they want to get one of those top receivers and uh, neighbors would be a welcome sight to Daniel Jones. Just stop me when, when you think, well, stop on the, uh, the quarterback needy teams. Um, the Titans at seven. No Falcons got Kirk now jets. No, although that would be kind of an interesting, you know, jets getting a backup. It's just a little too high for one of these guys. Bears get Caleb at 10 or had to have Caleb earlier at 10. Chargers picking at 11. Now here, the Broncos at 12. This is this is where I want to talk a little bit about another quarterback off the board. The betting favorite to land Bo Nix are the Denver Broncos. I think it's minus 120 right now. The next highest teams are plus 700. Is there a world you think where Denver, it, it would appear to be a reach, where they would reach on Bo Nix and give Sean Payton his quarterback of the future? No. Definitely not. Absolutely not. Well, so I'll, I'll say two things on this. One is every single year in the NFL draft, we're like six or seven years in a row of this now. Everyone thinks that an N number of quarterbacks are going in the first round, and the number is always N minus one, right? There's always one fewer quarterback, one guy who gets hyped up as a first rounder and who everyone has in their first round that falls because the NFL is not so high on them. Love it, last this year. year, that guy is Bo Nix. Like, I'm sorry to say, Bo Nix, he improved a ton from Auburn. There was a lot to like about what he did at Oregon over the past couple of years, right? I mean, Auburn, I know he was a team captain. He was a leader. But the dude was just flat out awful. He was looked a lot better at Oregon. But so much of that, and I mean so much of that, was the offensive system around him. He never really improved his technique. He frequently struggled to go through progressions at an appropriate pace. Almost all of his throws, like 70%, were under within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. And like half of them were at or below the line of scrimmage. The guy's old. He's gotten hurt a lot. And like he's athletic. I like it. But I don't look at this guy. You know, we're talking about upside. You were talking about J.J. McCarthy. You were talking about Caleb Williams, all that. I don't see the upside in Bo Nix. I think this guy at best is a – you remember Daniel Jones's good season? Mm-hmm. I think that is his ceiling, and I'm just not convinced that's a guy. I I tend to agree with you. I think Bo Nix, and well, and and I'm assuming you're also out on Penix here at twelve. I I'll, so I like Penix more than I like Bo Nix actually, but I am out. Folks aren't going to want to hear this. We're going to get lit up in the comments. I am out on quarterbacks for the rest. Of oh, the that's first it. Rounds. That's it. You're done. You're down, done for the rest of the first round. I think the, they're, they're going to be guys who start going early second. You know, you're going to see, um, just like you saw last year with Will Levis, teams that need quarterbacks will start either thinking about trading up or teams right at the top there who weren't able to get their quarterback. Guys like the Giants will start sniping. But no, I do not see any more quarterbacks going in the first round. Take the under, folks. So. The Broncos, to me, what, what, what I'm wondering is, is Sean Payton really going to roll in next season with Jarrett Stidham and who's, who, who's the backup right now? And Jarrett Stidham and, and Ben DiNucci. Like, I, I can't see that. Walmart Ben DiNucci. I can't see that happening. Denver, you don't think they trade back? Do you think they would trade potentially into the back half of the first round for one of these guys? I'm not sure there are a lot of teams looking to move up to 12, actually. And I agree with you that they're not going to ride with those guys. But there are so many quarterbacks, right? Bo oh, Nicks, later. Michael Panic, Spencer Rattler, mm-hmm. Joe Milton, Michael Pratt. Um, like they're a, they're a Jordan Travis. There are a number of guys they could go for later. I don't think. When teams reach on quarterbacks early, it is because they are desperate to get heat off their back from Mm -hmm. ownership, from fans, and so on. That's not where the Broncos are. I do not see the Broncos taking a guy who's 24 years old and who honestly, I think, has not shown that he is worth a first-round pick at 12. Okay. Now, if there is some incredible trade down, they move down into the mid to late 20s. Now we can start talking. You know, the difference between a quarterback in the mid to late 20s and the early second round is not significant. But I just don't see it. I, I agree that it, it feels too high to take Knicks or I, Penix. I actually might be able to get behind it, believe it or not. Uh, I still think it's a little high for him as well. I'm anticipating the Broncos going with one of the cornerbacks here, Mitchell or Arnold, um, depending on who they like more. So in the Raiders right after another AFC West team, uh, it sounds like, as you just said, you don't expect another quarterback to go here. Do you think that it's I've heard something that Antonio Pierce wants to th- be aggressive and go after a quarterback, but that Tom Telesco is a little bit more reserved. And, you know, at this point in the draft, we, we talked about this before. Who knows what's true and what's not that's coming out of, from reporters right now. 
Um, but I can actually believe that because Telesco, he just got there. You know, it didn't do well in LA. And if he comes out and swings immediately with the 14th overall pick or the 13th overall pick on a player uh, that a lot of people in the fan base would feel is overdrafted and misses, it's just, I mean, that's a tough, tough start and, and perhaps could be the beginning of a very short leash with Vegas. So I I, I also think the Raiders, and, and after the Raiders, you know, Saints, Colts, Seahawks, Jaguars, Bengals, Rams, yeah, I'm really not seeing a quarterback. Maybe Seattle or the Rams goes for someone for the future, but I, I don't think so. Um, so the Raiders, to me, are the last one before we could start to see some a significant drop pending a, a big trade up from someone else. Um, do you think the Raiders should be interested in one? Or you it sounds like the same situation as Denver. Again, I mean, not same situation, but like same kind of thought process. Of the, I just uh, I don't think they're under a lot of pressure to take a quarterback they don't believe in. Mm-hmm. I do not think those guys are first round prospects. I'd like to, I'm fine with them trading back. You know, there are a lot of like offensive line prospects. There's a lot of interesting ones. Receivers, there's a ton of great prospects. Like these quarterbacks, I think you should be aggressive with quarterbacks, but none of these prospects stand out to me as the kinds of guys that are so exciting that we need to give up on the really excellent tackle class or really excellent receiver class to get them. And, you know, it's not as though the Raiders or the Broncos wouldn't mind having a great receiver or a great tackle. So I, I don't see any reason to be that aggressive for quarterbacks here. Take a guy later in the draft, see if you can develop them. Low probability, better luck next year. All right, so first round, only four dudes. You know, I, I'm i not sure where it's going to be, but I, I do think that Knicks or Penix will go in the 20s. I, I think one of them will go, one of them will fall into day two. My guess would be right now that Knicks goes before Penix. And I could see a team like the Giants or perhaps the Broncos, unless, unless I'm forgetting something with the draft picks. But I think I think one of them will, will go late in round one, probably Knicks, and then Penix will go early on day two. That's my guess right now. And I think the Broncos, I'd be very surprised if the Broncos within their first two picks don't walk away with the quarterback. I, I, can't, I just can't see, I, I can't see Peyton rolling in. He's 60 years old. I mean, the dude, dude wants the quarterback. I, I think he'll have his guy. That, that's just that's just my take on it. The Raiders, I'm a, I'm a little bit more willing to see them roll out, even perhaps you know Minshew <laughs> next year, um, and then figure it out from there. But all right, so uh, so the quarterbacks, it's it's gonna be super fun. I can't remember the last time I was this excited for a quarterback class. Hey, Trevor Lawrence and Fields was a lot of fun, and Zach Wilson, that was probably it back in 2021. But this one, this one, I mean, the sheer number of quarterbacks and the top end talent. You should, Four guys potentially. Like this is gonna be an awesome draft class. So we'll move on now. Sticking with quarterbacks. A uh, you know, unfortunate stories as we always see with the uh, good news for the Green Bay Packers. Uh it was reported that Jordan Love, let me just pull up the article here. Jeremy Fowler said the Packers are committed to getting something done with Love. He got the he got the proof of concept last year with the big season, so they believe he's their future. This could heat up after the draft. He's due to make around ten million dollars next year. Signed the big one-year deal last offseason. It should be a lot bigger, putting him somewhere probably in the top 10 highest paid passers. So Ziggy and I sat back and went, all right, let's take a look at who are the top 10 highest paid quarterbacks in the NFL right now. You have Joe Burrow, $55 million, and number one. This is average per year. Burrow, $55 million. Herbert, second, 52.5. Lamar Jackson, $52 million. Jalen Hurts, 51. Those are the guys in the 50s. And then Kyler Murray, 46.1. That's your top five right there. So and then just just to be clear, number ten is Stafford at forty, right? Number ten is yeah. Then it's Deshaun Watson at forty six, uh, Kirk forty five, Mahomes forty five, Allen forty three, and Stafford at forty. So to say Jordan Love is getting top ten money, I mean that that feels like it, you know even you're lowballing it right there. I, I can see Jordan Love. Can he possibly be in the fifty million club? Yeah. So I think here is. So much of negotiation in the NFL depends on which contract your agent can convince the team to take as standard. And there are a few different options that teams can go with, right? So, like, here's one way that Jordan Love's agent might open up the conversation. Hey, remember that Daniel Jones guy? Mm -hmm. Remember how he got $40 million? Let's just, you know, I think Jordan Love's at least 20% better than Daniel Jones. So let's call it 50. Huh? Huh? Let's call it 50. Remember that Kirk Cousins guy? 
Remember how Jordan Love absolutely kicked his ass last year? Wait, no, wait. Telling me- no, 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 Look, Paul, I'm, I'm pretending to be his agent. You got to cut me some stuff. Fair enough. Am fair I making enough. stuff up? Absolutely. But so does every agent, right? He looked better than Kirk Cousins out there. Kirk Cousins ruptured his Achilles. He's getting 45 a year. Kirk wasn't out there. All right. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep look, going. look, look. You're telling me a guy who's 36 coming off a ruptured Achilles can get 45 a million and my client, Jordan Love, can't get 50? Oh, the, I mean, yeah. Absolute- you, you, you look at it all. I mean, he outplayed... He outplayed almost every quarterback on this list. Yeah, I mean, Baker Mayfield's getting 33, but think of how much better Jordan Love was, right? So that's, if you can get something like that as the four, or better yet, if you can say Kyler Murray is number five in the NFL, and Jordan Love is so much better than Kyler Murray, absolutely, I think there's a good chance negotiations end up there. Now put yourself in like Jordan Love's perspective, right? The Packers obviously are not going to want to pay him that much. They'll negotiate, but they're not going to be excited, I think, about paying him much more than like 42 or 43. They'll say Josh Allen just signed recently. You know, Mahomes took a deal that helped out the team. But if you're Jordan Love and you see how you just played, I get that you worry about the team a little bit, but that's not your problem. What reason do you have to not sign to sign a contract that's under 50 million? Oh, I don't, right. I, if you I don't go and it, hit yeah, the free market next year, you go and play, you either force the Packers to franchise tag you over and over again, or else you say, look, if I'm a free agent, you saw what Kirk Cousins got as a free agent. Think of, imagine Jordan Love was a free agent this year. He hadn't signed that extension. He didn't get a franchise tag. What do you think Jordan Love would have gotten paid on the open market this year? Over 50, no question. Yeah, I mean, right? there's a world where he even resets. But but that's, that's the whole point of this year is, is Jordan Love... I, and I know that a lot of the Packers fans who are watching, I say absolutely yes. Is and I, I I would think I would say yes as well. But but is he worth top five money off of the ten games? And I I, I mean that the potential seems to be yes. But even I mean look at these guys in the top six here. You know Jalen Hurts, he would get he was almost similar where he had one really good year, got this massive deal. Hurts regressed a little last year. I mean Tyler hasn't been the same since his contract. Deshaun Watson has been a, a nightmare. Like there's worlds where this backfires. I feel confident that Jordan Love will work out, and I would give him. Like if he asked for fifty million, I'd give it to him if I were the Packers. But I'm just saying, I I think that it's it's more of a question that like it won't be a question, but it, maybe it should be a little bit more of how much to give him. You just don't have a choice. Though. No, I and I that's agree. the that's, thing that's is the, 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 the number for quarterbacks just keeps going. Up. Yeah, it will never ever ever go down. And you look, there's there's plenty of guys up for extension next year that are going to ask for big money, right? Guys like, I'm thinking of what quarterbacks are going to be on the market next year, right? But I know Dak's on the market, Jared Goff's on the market, Trevor Lawrence is going to be on the market, Tua. Like, the money's going to go up. It just is. And even if Jordan Love doesn't play as well as last year, the fact that he put together that streak of nine games means his value next year to NFL teams is just going to be high. Oh, no. There's and, no and way around. Be. I mean, he, he again, we said if you had an MVP for the final half of the season, it's probably Jordan Love last yeah, year, which is just it's sick. He would have to go out and look so horrible the whole season. And I just guys don't do that. There are flashes in the pan, but Jordan Love looked consistent enough. I don't see him having an enormous drop off. And as long as that doesn't happen, it's cheaper to pay him now than to wait. And if he puts together another elite season, which is certainly possible, he could go for 60 next year. So I would lock him into a long-term deal while you can. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work out, I mean, getting out of these deals is easier than people think. You look at how the Eagles maneuvered their way out of that Carson Wentz contract. It can be done. You look at how the Packers maneuvered their way out of that Aaron Rodgers contract. It can be done. You have to sometimes just eat it. Yeah. So, so when, yeah, when, when, it's, when the report is that the Packers are about to offer Jordan Love top 10 money after the draft, I think a more accurate one is actually top five money. Like the, it, 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 my guess is this puts him in the top five. Um, unless my, but else. If I had to make a contract projection right now, 
It would be a four-year extension, so we'd be locked up for five years. The new money would be two hundred million. The guarantees would be one thirty. So what does that put him? That puts him in terms of fully guaranteed money, number five, ahead of Jalen Hurts. The Packers aren't tied up to him too long if things don't go well. Once year three rolls around of that extension, you can start negotiating another deal. But four, 200, 130, that is my prediction. There it is. And I would put him in the average average per year at number five, right behind Jalen Hurts at 51. So. I think uh, I, th- I think that's a solid number, and you know Mahomes when he took that contract, Ziggy, he did. I mean, he completely reset. I think that the first Mahomes contract is kind of the, the boom. In, in and now that Mahomes contract looks like a steal. Oh yeah, no. Right? It, every it, it does. year, people write articles. Like Mike Florio writes an article every two or three articles every year, talking about how unfair it is that the Chiefs have this contract. And if Mahomes had any sense, he'd negotiate something to get paid twice as much because it's such a cheat code for the Chiefs. At the like, yeah, no. yeah, like at the time, I don't know if I'd call it team friendly at the time, but now it, I called it team friendly at the time. It was a 10 year contract. <laughs> and now, yeah, now it certainly is now. It's, it's the fact that Patrick Mahomes is not in the top 10 or top five of paid players in the league is is pretty crazy. But you know what? I mean, it helps helps them win. That's that's why Chiefs are winning some Super Bowls. They it, it definitely helps. Uh last thing we'll talk about here before we wrap up this is very quickly here um you know we're talking about jalen hurts we're talking about jordan love kind of a cool announcement where the nfl said uh the packers and the eagles are going to open week one friday night football in brazil in sao paulo uh, which is i honestly i think it's the first south african or south american south african i think it's the first south american football game that we've ever had and it'll be kind of fun just to see that happen you know it's it's great for the packers unfortunately in that in all these international games these neutral field games the eagles are actually the home team here so the packers have one less away game on their schedule which uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty bummed out about i would much rather prefer to see them hosting that game and, and losing a lambo game but uh just a kind of a cool announcement there um friday well, night know, football that's uh it, the nfl is really starting to they're really starting to spread out these games i mean they, they know what they're doing these are two funny teams that go and play at Corinthians, actually. I don't know how much. Do you know anything about Corinthians? No, not. It's one of the bigger Brazilian football clubs. And in unofficial rule in Corinthians, actually, this is, this is what makes these teams so funny. Their number one rival, Palmeiras, they wear the color green. And this rivalry is so heated that there are signs up in the arena banning the color green. No <laughs> fans wear the color green. I didn't like, know that. Green is not allowed. If you go in the wrong weekend to this club and wear green, you will get beat up or worse. So it's going to be really funny, actually. I would not be surprised to see neither team wear green because of this. <laughs> Could you, you maybe uh, you see the you Eagles imagine Packers black. versus Eagles all like all white versus all black. It, it might the be Eagles, Eagles have black. those sick yeah. all black uniforms. That's what they like. They've worn that a few times. The Packers have those whites. That would just for their road games. I think that'd be hilarious. That that actually, if if that's all. I mean, I'm assuming that's all true. That might be exactly what happens. It's the the first time the NFL has played a game on a Friday night of opening weekend in over 50 years. Cardinals Rams, September 18th, 1970. So it's uh, yeah, it's kind of a cool a cool opening to the season. But man, with Christmas game on a Wednesday, Friday night opener, you know, Black Friday game, the uh, the world of football on only Sunday, Monday, and Thursday is slowly starting to change. Which I actually only expect expect it to continue what we have two friday games this year right yeah i mean we've got that crazy christmas week it's honestly i don't know i don't know how much i like it being on a friday i actually like i i enjoy and maybe this is just because i work in sports media and that we work on sports media but i i like having the sunday monday thursday and then the other days are off if you if the nfl gets into this where they're having friday games and you know this is probably more of a future issue that could potentially happen but I, I i would just i'm a little weary of what's what could potentially happen i mean the thing is is when it was a once in a while thing you know very rarely the nfl would have games on other days that was okay now we have but now three. it feels like they're just trying to squeeze in as many days as they can possibly have nfl football and i totally get why right oh it makes sense it complete sense like they're a business it increases viewership numbers i understand but there was something special about Like, I don't think there's something special about the NFL Sunday where almost every team in the league is playing. 
that's one thing I like about it so much more than the NBA is you get to tune in for one day of like incredible fun. Then the occasional primetime Wednesday, Thursday game. But you've like so many things happen in the league on Sunday. And now that's increasingly not going to be the case. I mean, and, and again, this is just one game. And, and we're talking and we're talking about Black, like Black Friday and, and Christmas. Where there's three games now that we're really talking about here. But it um, I don't mind the Saturday games at the end of the year. I think those are actually pretty fun. But you're right. That Sunday feeling does have a little bit of March Madness to it, where it's it, it, what you have. You have like 14 different games being played at the beginning of the season. So, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm just a little a little worried about what could potentially happen down the road here. Uh, but for now, still, uh, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Opening weekend, Sao Paulo, Friday night. Like I, I will enjoy that. And, and it's a fun game. Packers and Eagles are you know, two teams that could very well be competing uh, for the NFC over the course of the season. So. We'll wrap up with that. We uh, when we come back next week, we I remember I just remember I put out the mailbag um, earlier today. The questions we'll hit those in the Wednesday night recording for the Thursday show, and uh, we'll have Jack and Zach back hopefully for that one, and it'll be a good time. So Ziggy, I think that that was pretty good there. A little bit of uh, a little bit of NFL draft talk when we get back one week away, and we'll see who our new quarterback of the future is in Minnesota soon. It's going to be exciting, Paul. Yeah, it's uh, oh gosh, what a what a what a great next couple of days here for uh, for NFL excitement. We'll see you soon.